Well, good morning. Welcome to Church at Home with Glory Baptist Church in Aiken, Minnesota. You can find out more online about us at aikinchurch.com, A-I-T-K-I-N church.com. We post our sermons on Facebook each week, our worship service, as well as on YouTube, and so you're welcome to watch in either place and would invite you to like and share. The more you do that, uh, the more God's word gets spread into the world and we get to share the love of Jesus with people all over who knows where. And so as you like and share and subscribe on YouTube, uh, it does help us get the message out there. A couple of real quick things. If you go to our website, you will find that each week we continue to uh, provide a worship bulletin. And on that, it's got various highlights on the front first page, uh, one of which is talking about, you know, the the bus garage we have here at the church and how the work continues on that despite the COVID-19 crisis and uh, how we desire to finish paying off uh, the garage for the bus and get all that wrapped up. And many thanks to all who've been working on that. The trustees have been uh, diligently at work, um, even while social distancing, getting things done here at Glory Baptist Church. So much thanks to that. The other thing is, reminders, uh, you can give online. We have e-giving. We, we appreciate your financial support. That helps us keep doing the things we are doing, helps us keep supporting missionaries and staff here at the church and all the other expenses of operating the building, despite the fact we're not gathering physically on Sunday. You know, there's still light bills and heat bills and internet and all that, and, and we do appreciate uh, that you give and continue to support us, and so many of you have been just tremendously generous. Uh, we are blessed and thankful for that. If you go to the church's website, top right-hand corner, uh, just click on the Give. You can give electronically. It's a, a very safe, secure system. Um, we would not utilize this company if we did not fully trust them. And so if you need help setting up an account with them, we could do that. Just let us know. We will help you out. And then finally, inside of the bulletins are things. Um, we have some, some relevant things for Memorial Day, a kind of a, a sheet of remembrance there. Would encourage you to download that and read through that and give that some thought, as well as uh, a call to prayer. Now, verses of the week, Ecclesiastes 11.5. Uh, the family of the week says all veterans, past and present, and reminding us that it's Memorial Day, which specifically focuses on our, our veterans of the past who have served and, and passed on and who want to be in remembrance of them. Uh, listings of, of various families we're play, praying for within our church as well as uh, in our extended church family, and then other things to pray for, whether it's our governmental leaders or, or the persecuted church this particular week. We're praying for the believers in China and what's been going on there. Um, some of the missionaries of the week are listed. So lots of things there for us to be in prayer for. And so with that, I uh, would invite you here. Why don't you join me in a moment of prayer and then we will continue on. God, again, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love. Thank you for the chance to be in your word. Even though we are spread in various places, our hearts are still together. Our minds are still together. God, we thank you that you are working all things for the good of those who love you. And, and God, even in this time of social distancing, we know that you are God in control over all of the universe. And so, God, we will not be a people of fear, but we will be a people of faith. And, and God, we put our hope and trust in you in that and just pray that you would lead us and guide us. Um, pray that you would continue to pour your blessing upon us. Lord, we pray for those who are hurting this week, whether it's emotional, physical, mental, spiritual pains, uh, financial pains, Lord. There's much going on in the world, and so we pray for that. Pray, God, that uh, you would lift up those who need that uplifting. And God, where we can be your hands and feet, uh, may you guide us to do so, that we might love others with what you have uh, bountifully poured into so many of our lives. May we be a blessing to others. And God, we just continue to pray for our world, for our leaders, uh, locally, regionally, nationally, uh, so much to be in prayer for God. And, and we are thankful that you are a God who hears our prayers, that you respond, that uh, you, you work in this world in, in abundant and amazing ways. And so God, just pray for your work and your will. Pray for leaders who would honor you. Pray for uh, all the decisions to be made in the weeks to come. Pray for your guidance in each and every uh, step of that process. And again, God, we thank you for the men and women who have served in the past and done so much to establish the fact that we can freely worship you publicly, openly, without fear of retribution. God, may we continue to have that freedom. We thank you for that. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
going to read to you three different portions of Scripture. Uh, the sermon today's focus is going to be on Genesis 1-1, but I'm going to read to you Genesis 1, uh, 1 and 2, 1, Genesis 1, verses 1 and 2, and then I'm going to read to you uh, John 1, 1 through 5, and then Hebrews 11, 1 through 3. And the reason I do this is they all piggyback and pair really nicely uh, with one another and kind of work towards the idea of what you will see coming in the sermon. So if you've got a Bible, feel free to open that up. If not, uh, you can pull up version, which is Bible.com, and, and read the Bible on your phone or your iPad or your computer if you have that. And I'm going to read it for you as well. Genesis 1, 1 and 2, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then John 1, 1 through 5 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And then Hebrews 11, 1 through 3. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old re received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. This is the reading of God's Word, and now let's jump into the sermon. Well, welcome to our sermon series from the book of Genesis. Genesis means origins or beginning. And this book, the book of Genesis, lays the groundwork not only for the next book that is to come as, Je as Exodus, but, but also it lays the groundwork for all of the rest of Scripture. The idea of, of beginnings is really an appropriate name for this book. In it, we have the creation of the world, the entrance of sin and death into the world, the invention of the arts, the, the rise of nations, especially in, in the beginning of the, the early church and the state of the early church in its earliest days. We also get to, to see the beginnings of the families that, that keep showing up in the, all across the story of the Bible. The book, of course, begins with God's creation of the world. But its early chapters also record three low points in primeval history. The fall, the flood, and sin at Babel as well. In each of those instances, God responds in both judgment and in grace. And so in the very first chapters of Genesis, as he is acknowledged to be the creator and sovereign Lord, he's also shown to be the, the God of justice and mercy simultaneously, even in his responses to the rebellion of man. This book, uh, the book of Genesis, can be divided into two different parts. The first 11 chapters give us primeval history. And then from chapter 12 all the way to the end of the book in Genesis chapter 50, we have the history of the patriarchs. So you have primeval history and then patriarchal history. The stories of what happened in the world before the time of the patriarchs and then the focus on, on four particular patriarchs. It's kind of how it breaks out. And interestingly enough, each half of the book focuses on four different events or people. The first half of the book, uh, in chapters 1 through 11, contains, as I've mentioned, this primeval history. And it emphasizes four different great events. Uh, it talks about the creation from Genesis 1 until Genesis 2. And then it talks about the fall and its aftermath from Genesis 3 until Genesis 5. And then the flood from Genesis 6 until Genesis 9. And then the events surrounding the Tower of Babel in Genesis 10 and Genesis 11. And then in the second half of the book, covering the, the patriarchal history, it also focuses on four things. In this case, the lives of four great patriarchs. Abram had been mentioned in, in chapter 11, so he serves kind of as the bridge between the two books, between the first and second half of the book of Genesis. And so his story is told from Genesis 12 all the way until Genesis 20. And then we focus on the life of his son, Isaac, from Genesis 21 to Genesis 26. And then we move on to Jacob. Jacob, his son, from, from Genesis 27 through Genesis 36. And then finally, 
The book concludes by focusing on the life, on the story, on the biography of a man by the name of Joseph. And Joseph's story goes from Genesis 37 all the way to Genesis 50. And it's interesting to note that, that Genesis sets forth, sets forth for us some themes which are hardly developed again until we come back to the New Testament. For instance, uh, the garden and the river in that garden and the tree of life are all revisited in the book of Revelation, which is the last book of the Bible. Along with that, the, the serpent and Babylon, which play an important part in the first 11 chapters of Genesis, they show up again throughout the book of Revelation. Genesis, you may be interested to know, is the third most quoted book of the Old Testament in the New Testament. You may be able to guess the other two. One, logically, is Psalms. Psalms is frequently quoted in the New Testament. And the other, of course, is Isaiah. And in many ways, Genesis is, is almost more like the New Testament than it is like its Old Testament counterparts. Some of its topics are, are barely heard about again until their implications can fully emerge along with the gospel later on in the New Testament. Things like the institution of marriage, uh, the fall of man, the, the jealousy of Cain, the judgment of the flood, the, the imputed righteousness of the believer, uh, the, the rival ideas of the promise and the flesh, the profanity of Esau, the pilgrim status of believers in this life. All of these are predominantly New Testament things, but they're set forth, set forth first in the Old Testament. Now, if we'll remember that, it will impact the whole way in which we look at the rest of the Old Testament. Genesis is the very foundation of the faith on which the truth subsequently taught in Scripture is built, and therefore we can never do away with nor get away from the book of Genesis. We are never done with these truths. And isn't it interesting that in our, our day and in our time, it is precisely against the truths that we find in the book of Genesis that the world has been pushing back on. So it's definitely worth our time to study these passages. The book of Genesis, especially in the first section in chapters 1 through chapters 11, is designed to remind us of several great facts. It reminds us, for instance, that, that God created the world and is distinct from it, but he is not unconcerned for it. It reminds us that God shaped his creation from formlessness into order, from emptiness into fullness. The book of Genesis reminds us that God's world was originally good. And so since we live in a corrupted world, we must remember that it is a, a different thing from that which God had originally made. It also reminds us that man's sin is entirely responsible for the corruption of God's original creation. And that in that, God's character is revealed as he responds to our brokenness and corruption. So now with that as kind of your introduction, let's dig in a little bit to Genesis 1. We're going to look at just the first two verses primarily. And these first two verses of the book of Genesis, they bring us face to face with this ultimate reality. The ultimate of all realities is God. And, and no surprise that, that God himself is the subject of the very first sentence of the Bible. And if we miss the significance of that, we've missed everything, frankly. God is the ultimate reality, the one true God. And that should be our very first filter of faith. God is the creator of all that we know, of the heavens and of the earth. And there's two things that I want you to catch here from this passage. The first you will see is in the very first verse here is where we have this declaration about God and about the world. We see that, that we as Christians here acknowledge that, that God is the maker of the heavens and the earth. We get these glorious words that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And those words are, are rich and full of deep spiritual truth. Notice in that who the author of it is. The author and the source, uh, the cause of all of creation, says Genesis 1.1, is God. And it's 
not an accident that, that, that God is the subject of this first sentence in the Bible. And not only that, but God then dominates this first chapter in every sort of way. 35 times in as many verses, the name of God is repeated. And so we are pushed over and over again by Moses, who was the human author of this book, that, that God is the central focus of this account that he records for us here in Genesis 1. And then with that, we see clearly within that, that God is personal. And that means too then that, that if God is personal, that God is relational, which frankly is really good news for you and for me. It's also interesting that throughout the book of Genesis, there is not a mention of another God except for in one lone story. And that underlines the truth that, that Moses wants us to understand, that the only God, the creator of the heavens and the earth and everything in it, is the only God there is, Yahweh, the one true God, the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, the God of Jacob, the God who is the one who created everything. He is the only God that there is. And it's interesting that the only time in Genesis that other gods are, are mentioned is the time when Jacob steals away from Laban. And Laban comes after him because some of his gods, the story tells us, had been stolen now realize, if you've never caught this before in that story, Moses' tongue is firmly planted in his cheek there. The only time that other gods are mentioned in the book of Genesis and what happened to them is this time where those gods get stolen. And if they were really gods, they obviously couldn't be stolen. So Moses there is actually mocking the other gods in that story as he tells it. Notice also that even in these first chapters of Genesis, they, they reveal that, that God's ways are perfect. As we look at the beginning of Genesis, we, we learn about the expulsion from the garden and the cataclysm of the flood and the expulsion and spreading, uh, that, that scattering that occurs at the time of Babel. And it reminds us that God will not tolerate sin. He can't stand its presence. He will bring his judgment against sin. And it's interesting that even in each of these events, alongside of God's justice and his judgment, is a very clear presentation of his grace. Even in God's judgment against Adam and Eve, we're going to see that the promise and the grace is there. Maybe a little hidden, but it's there. Even in the words of condemnation and judgment against woman, against Eve and, and womankind and the seed of that promise, even within that, the gospel is present. Even in the judgment of the flood, there's the preservation of the created order and the family upon which God has set his love. And even after the scattering of Babel, God will call a man out of the pagan culture of Ur of Chaldees and make him head of the race of his chosen people. Over and over again, we see judgment, but we also see grace. And you know what? We find something out about God in that process. We find out that, that God is holy and loving, and, and neither one of those attributes are emphasized at the expense of the other. He is fully righteous and fully love simultaneously. So it begins with us learning about God as the author of creation. But we also begin to see here the effects of God's work. The production of, of the heavens and the earth. And, and that phrase, by the way, simply means the entirety of the universe. Everything in this universe was produced by him. Now, this is so important because in other accounts of creation that you get from the ancient world, it's not clear that God has produced everything. There are elements in the universe which seem co-eternal with the very first and the greatest of God's worshipped, by the other cultures at this time, but not so with the God of Israel. 
in the beginning, he was. When there was nothing else, he already was. And that brings us to the third thing in this passage in in verse 1 that we learn. And that is the way in which God created. God created out of nothing the heavens and the earth. And Moses is going to teach us from verse 3 on that he created the world by the word of his power. He literally spoke it into being. And so as we talk about this in theological terms, we use the phrase from the Latin that's, that he created ex nihilo. He created from nothing. There was nothing before the world. There was nothing before he created. But when he created, he brought everything into being. The author of the book of Hebrews in the New Testament says it this way in Hebrews 11, verse 3. It says, by faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. And so the author there stresses that this creation of of the visible world came from nothing. Now look, from the very, very beginning of philosophy, the pagan philosophers had had two speculations about the nature of the world in which we live. Some taught that there was a a time where there was nothing, and then something replaced that. Others taught that the universe had always been there in some way, shape, or form. And it's, quite frankly, very interesting that those are still the two options in contrast to the Christian view of creation. Now, don't be confused by this whole issue of creation. There really are only three different options out there on the market. And don't think that the the Christian view has somehow been disproved by science. It hasn't. There is an idea that, that this impression is in the world that not only has the Christian doctrine of creation been disproved, but that scholars somehow have agreed upon an alternative. But neither of these assumptions is correct. There is no agreed upon alternative to the Christian position. Those which are affirmed, those other two ideas, are beset with enormous difficulties. The Christian doctrine, on the other hand, seems to have no particular difficulty of its own. It is supported by a a great body of argument philosophical and scientific, and is confirmed by the whole process of special revelation in which God both asserts and describes himself. And there's really only these three ideas out there on the market. There's the Christian view, and that view is that, that before creation, God alone existed, and that he and his sovereignty is responsible for bringing into being everything there is. And then in contrast to that view, there are two other options. First, there's the view that before creation, nothing. Nothing existed. Before the universe was, there was nothing. Absolutely nothing. Not God, not matter, not mass. Nothing. Now, it needs, I think it's fair to say, a a pretty large measure of faith or or foolishness to rest in that particular view, that there was nothing and then there was everything. Nothing created everything? How, 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 what? Right? The philosophers themselves said, ex nihilo, nihili fit, which means out of nothing, nothing comes. Nothing can't create something. And so that is an idea that's out there, but It's a very implausible idea. The fact that something now exists drives us to the conclusion that there is indeed something that has always existed, right? Does that make sense? Now, in contrast to that view, for those who don't want to accept God, they put before us another view. And that view is is the one that's probably the most popularly held among scientists and physicists today. 
And that view is that before the creation of the universe as we know it now, an impersonal something existed. Some protoplasm or some primary particle in which all the potentialities later realized in the whole of the universe, all of those were housed in that thing. Listen to this description about that theory. Surely the existence of an impersonal something is no less a mystery and no less a stumbling block to the radically skeptical intellect than the existence of God himself. If you claim that everything came from a primary particle of protoplasm, doesn't that primary particle of protoplasm then have in itself all of the characteristics of a sovereign God except for personality? Let me go on with this description. Such a something already possesses some of the characteristics of deity, right? It's eternal. It's self-existent. And it's omnipotent because it's going to be able to create all things. Additionally, this theory of origins is burdened with all of the difficulties that face consistent materialism. The, the nature of the universe itself is against it. It's incredibly difficult, frankly, to believe that the complexity of the life forms with which we are familiar with is the result of an unprogrammed molecular and genetic change. And it's even more difficult to convince ourselves that things like the writings of Shakespeare or the engine that powers your car, or, or frankly, even the technology that brings my beautiful smiling face into your living room or wherever you might be watching it. Uh, it's hard to believe that Shakespeare or engines or all of this technology that needs to take place was derived through an endless series of random chance events and evolutions along the way. The movement from impersonal to the person is an impossible barrier for nat modern naturalism and materialism. And don't let anybody fool you into thinking that somehow they have it all figured out. That philosophy has enormous problems. And frankly, I'd much rather have the ones that we would struggle with as Christians believing that God created it all. Notice finally that in this verse, the time of the work is given. It says, in the beginning. It was in the beginning that God created. In this verse, we have kind of the, the coup de grace against all atheism and, and modern skepticism and naturalism and materialism. In this verse, the sovereign Lord's rights and interests in all things are shown by virtue of his being the creator of creation. God was and is fully active and involved in his creation. And because of that, and don't miss this, that means he is active and involved in our lives too. Even, frankly, if we don't want him to be. Even when we don't see it. He is the creator God. And he loves you and he wants to be in relationship with you both now here on earth and as well as for all of eternity as well. If you haven't heard that before, let me say it to you again. The very God who created all of this, the entirety of the universe, who holds all of space and time in his hands, that very God knows you, loves you, and wants you to know and love him in return. That is what this beginning of the book of Genesis is about. And this is just the tip of the iceberg of the great things that are to come. I'm so glad that you've joined us for this journey through the book of Genesis. Would you join me in prayer? Father God, we thank you again that you share with us these stories that we can draw from and learn from and see that even before there was time, God, you were working on our behalf, that you had a plan, that you created all of this for us. Out of your generosity, out of your love, you created it. And then, Lord, we broke it. We corrupted it. We made a mess of it. Each and every one of us, God, including pastors, we're all sinners, all of us. 
We have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We are sinners in need of a Savior. We've broken the relationship with you. It wasn't just Adam and Eve's sin, Lord. It was all of us. We've all sinned. And because of that, the world is broken, and in many ways, and not the way it's supposed to be and the way that you intended. But the good news is, God, that you had a plan, that you knew that was probably going to happen. You knew that we were going to come along and make a mess of things. And so, Lord, you had a plan in place even before there was time that you would send your son Jesus on our behalf. And God, we are so thankful for that, that you want to be in relationship with us. And because of that, and because you won't tolerate sin, you sent Jesus to bridge that gap for us. Maybe, God, today there's somebody who's listening who never understood this fully and never, never knew that you wanted to be in relationship with us. Lord, if they're hearing for that, For the very first time, I pray even in this moment, God, that they, along with all of us, we all need to repent of our sin. But if somebody's never heard that before, God, that even in this moment, they would pray, just in this moment, that yes, God, I am a sinner in need of a Savior. I I have sinned and fallen short of your glory. I've made a mess of things and I can't fix it. I'm the problem, not the solution. And in that very moment, God, if we would turn to Jesus and put our hope and trust in Him, in Him alone, and we can inherit eternal salvation. If we can come back into relationship with you, we can be forgiven of all of our failures, past, present, and future. What an amazing love story you have for us, God. That you set this forth thousands of years ago, and today we are still benefiting from it. God, we thank you that even before there was time, you were working on our behalf, and that truly in that You are working to save us so that we could have eternal life with you. God, we are blessed and humbled that you would choose us, that you would love us, that you would share all of this with us. And Lord, as we go forth from this place today and into the world and beyond, God, may you empower us to share that story with others and allow it to impact them and to change the world to your glory. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love. It's in the beautiful name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Well, once again, thank you for stopping in and joining us here at Glory Baptist Church. And if somehow we could love you, serve you, pray for you, be a blessing to you in some way, shape, or form, please let us know. You can leave a comment. You can send us an email. Give us a call. Write us a letter. Whatever it takes. Just let us know. If we can be a blessing in your life, it would be a blessing to us to do so. Thank you for stopping by and spending time with us. And as I like to say always, wash your hands frequently, make much of Jesus always, go forth and serve your King, and stay awesome. Looking forward to seeing you soon. God bless.